Well, good morning, everyone, and welcome uh, to the 26th meeting of this, the Equalities and Human Rights Committee of 2017. Can I remind everybody to turn phones to silent mode? Um, I'd like to start by offering the apologies of our convener, Christina McKelvey, and uh, moving straight on to our first agenda, item one, which is continuation of our draft budget scrutiny for the 2018-19 Scottish Parliamentary Budget, or Scottish Government Budget, rather. Um, I'd like to start by uh, welcoming our panel today, and we have Danny Boyle uh, from the Parliamentary Officer from BMIS, Shari Bose, from, who is the Research Advisor from Scottish Women's Convention, Emma Rich, who's Chief Executive of Engender, and Rebecca Marek, who is Policy and Parliamentary Officer for the Commission for Racial Equality, uh, Queerer. Uh, you're all very welcome. Um, please don't press the microphone buttons when you, it's your turn to speak. That will be done for you. Um, I think I'd like to start by, first of all, um, thanking you all for your extensive submissions on our inquiry here. Um, clearly got some very strong views on that, and that's welcome. Um, so starting with Rebecca and working down the panel, I think I'd like you just to give us what, what you would like us to take away most from your written submissions and our work in the, the draft budget scrutiny. Sure. Good morning. Thanks very much for inviting CRER along. I think what we would like to put across from a race equality perspective is that while we certainly welcome the publication of the equality budget statement and all the work that goes into that, we think a lot more detail needs to be given on mainstreaming of race equality initiatives. Um, at the moment, it's somewhat restricted to the community social security and equality section, especially the equality budget, budget but um, with the publication of the race equality framework for Scotland in 2016, we sort of want to see more of a push towards mainstreaming race equality across various portfolios and discussion in those portfolios about where discrepancies lie for minority ethnic communities and how action and funding can be taken to address those discrepancies. One of the issues with that, with that is that there's a bit of a bit of a dearth of um, robust evidence around equalities especially race equality, um, as detailed in the government's equality evidence strategy. So we'd also like to see some initiatives for gathering more evidence to detail further where those discrepancies lie, and also some commitment towards evaluating projects and initiatives that go to try to eliminate some of those discrepancies and the discrimination to make sure that we're putting funding in the right place and that the approach that we're taking to address those issues is as effective as possible. Thank you, Rebecca. Shari? Um, so we've been consulting with women for the past year on a number of things that are causing them concern. Um, one of the main ones that's coming out, we understand that mental health, we, know, we did welcome last year the 150 million for five years over the mental health portfolio, uh, but we would like to see more explicit gendered, especially for younger women over mental health concerns. Um, also, the new Social Security bill, whilst it's only 15% of that that's getting devolved, we would like to see further study going into equality, especially around um, Social Security that's still reserved to Westminster, the likes of universal credit. We know that the Scottish Government is making strides and they've done a number of initiatives to split payments twice and pay payments directly to landlords. But there's still arguments coming out that um, are going towards women from job centres around the fact that universal credit is getting women into work when it's really leaving them without top-up benefits and leaving a lot of in-work poverty. So that and also education. There's still a lot needing to be done around especially sexual education and consent for young women. And that really needs to be looked at, we think, within the portfolios. Great. Thank you. Uh, Emma? Um, thanks very much, um, and thanks for inviting Engender to give evidence on this. Um, in our written submission, we concentrated on a couple of examples, um, which we think underline our very broad point, which we've been making before this committee for some years, um, that gender budget analysis does need to be integrated into the Scottish budget process. Uh, and I think the budget review group in its um, final report made some really useful suggestions about the way that equality evidence might be incorporated into the budget process and considered and contemplated by all of the committees undertaking scrutiny. Um, we along with CRER and other equality organisations ex very much welcome the equality budget statement and the work that goes into that. Um, however, we've identified in our written evidence over a number of years that this is now really a post hoc list of 
areas of equality spend rather than a systematic consideration of the equality impact of portfolio spending and is not driving decision making and budget setting so much as describing what has happened at the end of that process. And that is useful for creating visibility around equality spend. Um, but as we set out in our submission, uh, this does tend to be concentrated in a couple of portfolios and we don't see systematic consideration um, of specific equality ambitions across the portfolios. So our two examples of women's enterprise, um, funding for that is still largely concentrated in the equality, the central equality budget, which is a £20.3 million fund for strategic intermediaries and um, other kind of demand-led projects, um, and violence against women, which again is concentrated within that central equality budget and also the subject of ad hoc pieces of funding, um, such as the extremely welcome £20 million in the justice portfolio that has been dispersed over the past couple of years. Um, but our concern is that the systematic ambitions of uh, Scottish Government, um, as set out in Equally Safe, the Violence Against Women strategy, is not reflected in, in spending commitments and doesn't resonate across the various portfolios. Um, so our point is that gender budget analysis across the whole budget would um, connect the allocation of resources to strategic priorities. Um, and I think that very much plays into the outcomes based scrutiny intentions that were surfaced during the budget review process. Thank you, Emma. And finally, Danny. Good morning, <clears throat> committee. Uh, thank you very much for inviting us along this morning to uh, give evidence. I would like to apologise on behalf of Mimas that we didn't submit any written evidence. Uh, that doesn't reflect the importance within which we place uh, this conversation, but probably is, is more rather connected to the significant workload to which we have at the moment. Um, I would, however, having read the submissions which we've received or which were received by uh, the committee from from my colleagues here, uh, reiterate probably, you know, somewhat what what Rebecca's already outlined uh, from a race equality um, perspective. We we've went through the last couple of years this process of developing a race equality framework for Scotland. Uh, we're now moving into the next stage of that, where we'll have the independent advisors uh, action plan. Uh, or the independent advisors' um, review of that and, and the Scottish Government's action plan to take it forward. What we've reiterated to colleagues within um, the Equality Unit primarily, who are, our, who are our touchstone within government, and I think this is shared, uh, certainly going by what's been said this morning, is that organisations, as, as much as within the draft budget statement, we welcome the maintenance uh, of the equality and third sector and human rights aspect of, um, of the budget. That in itself is not uh, an appropriate um, level of funding in order to tackle the systematic issues which we are aware of, which exist across multiple policy areas. So we've said it, you know, till we're blue in the face. Um, Bemis, Clare, Semvo, other colleagues within the race equality sector and the Scottish Government's equality unit specifically do not have uh, the power dynamics uh, in order to change some of the long-term systematic issues. Funding for our organisations is naturally incredibly welcome, but we're the tip of the iceberg in relation to what's actually required to change some of these issues. Rebecca touched upon mainstreaming uh, and ensuring that different government departments uh, take actual uh, substantive measures to amend some of the real issues which are, which are going on here. And just to touch on some of the, the aspects which are outlined within the draft budget statement, we talk about inclusive growth, we talk about city deals, and we talk about housing. We would envisage, or we, we are aware that we, we see these things as being interconnected. Um, the first time that we were invited to talk to the Equality and Human Rights Committee, uh, just after it was set up, we, we talked about procurement and issues such as that as being race equality issues. And that's coming more to the fore now. You know, when we talk about 50,000 new houses being built in the tendering process and that linked into the city dealing inclusive growth, if we get these aspects right, then we will amend or, or begin to tackle some of the issues or uh, inequalities which exist in employment and low pay, overcrowding in housing, so on and so forth, which are easily identifiable within multiple ethnic and cultural minority communities. So we know what has to be done. Uh, we know the, the power players who have to come in in order to make those amendments. 
and we want to see and would hope that this draft scrutiny is not just uh, you know, a philosophical conversation about what we want to do next. We would like to see people who are in charge of inclusive growth or city deals or housing uh, give an analysis or overview of how their budget will be spent in the coming period to uh, respond to some of these long-term issues. Great. Thank you. Thank you all for that. Um, I have a couple of supplementals just from what you said before I open to the wider committee. Um, it seems to me that, that what you're telling us is there's two kind of uh, layer, layers of this budget budgetary process in respect of the uh, groups or uh, communities that you represent. Um, firstly, there's the direct uh, corollary between budget lines and, say, for example, gender where you can go through in, the, in terms of a gender analysis of the budget, which particular budget lines speak to women's issues in particular and are delineated or siloed exactly for uh, the furtherment of um, issues affecting women. And then I think there's the, the slightly lower tier, which is the more general, if we invest in this because either um, our communities from ethnic minority backgrounds are adversely and disproportionately impacted by a lack of spending in that area previously, um, then we can help that community more uh, by investing in those areas. So there's the, the direct budget lines, and then the more diffuse invest in this area, it will improve something which has traditionally been an area which has affected this community more. Um, we can only do so much as the Scottish Parliament passing a budget, because obviously with the presumption against ring fencing, a lot of public spend happens at local authority level. Um, how much uh, would you say that local authority budgets uh, mirror your aspirations in this regard? Again, perhaps if we, we go in reverse order this time and, and start with Danny. The, the general point is still the same, uh, whether it's national government budgets or local authority budgets. There's not that required mainstreaming um, or cognizance of the need to have a much more strategic approach to amending these issues. If we look at the city deals, which is obviously a partnership between local authorities and national government, uh, then that's quite a, a clear example of a lack. It, 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 I don't want to be seen to be overly critical of um, the good work that's been done. <clears throat> there's, there's a propensity sometimes when uh, we're approaching local authorities in order to try and amend some of their practices, that they, they approach race equality with a trepidation or a fear. What we're trying to change is their recognition that this should be a positive process in terms of, uh, as, as has been recognised in terms of uh, inclusive growth, that if we get it right, it's beneficial as a domino effect across a number of areas. So again, just reiterate the, the key point, there's not enough of a focus on getting the best out of the investments which we're making. Now, within this, it talks about procurement. Uh, within the draft budget, rather, it talks about procurement, which is also relevant to the city deals. <clears throat> and it makes a point about embedding within the procurement process issues around about, say, uh, equal pay, so on and so forth. What we said when we first came to this committee, I think it was about a year ago or so, is that those strategic conversations have to be happening in relation to procurement, house building, local authorities, uh, and, for example, as part of that tendering process, how many modern apprenticeships will be offered by company X, Y, and Z over the coming period, and what is our strategy going to be in order to ensure that those opportunities are open to as many people as possible and that we use the positive action measures which are inherent within the Equality Act to try and amend that. We don't see at the moment, uh, a strategic um, momentum in that regard. Thank you. And if I can tack on a, a second question as part of that basket, is um, is there good examples of good practice within Scotland's 32 local authorities that w to which you could point? Emma? So, um, the question about budget process, uh, it, are, is any of, or are any of the local authorities um, doing gender mainstreaming as part of their budget process? I think the short answer to that is no. Um, we have, as uh, in gender and the Scottish Women's Budget Group, similarly uh, have focused on the national budget process, um, in part because the international evidence for how that might be done and what impact that then may have is strongest. Um, and our our kind of theory of change is that should this change be realised and evident in the national budget, then that would 
set uh, an example of practice for local authorities working with their own within their own budget processes. Um, I am not therefore aware of any examples of good practice across the 32 local authorities. I think Danny makes a good kind of subsidiary point about programs of spend and the way that those are equality impact assessed. Um, this committee will of course be aware that the public sector equality duty requires all public bodies, including Scottish Government and all of those said 32 local authorities, to look at the impact on significant pieces of policy. And that includes programs of spend and programs of delivery. Um, so we are similarly concerned um, about the failure to get a bit of a grip on procurement, which is subject to its own specific duty in Scotland. So public authorities must procure um, with an eye on the equality outcomes of that. And I think we are seeing a clash between um, the European Procurement Directive and this ambition in which the Procurement Directive seems to be emerging the victor, despite um, European cases um, from across the, the current member states of instances where that isn't happening. Um, so I think we can see areas to progress across the national budget, across local authority budget processes, and also across procurement um, on the part of all public bodies. Thank you. Shari? Um, I would echo both Emma and Danny. We, all, we focus like gender on the national budget, but again, we're also seeing when it comes to local authorities, um, a bit of a lack of gender mainstreaming, just because, as Danny says, there does seem to be this sort of fear almost around it, and, it's, and it should be really seen as a positive thing. Um, and in terms of best practice, the only thing that I can give is in relation to Miles Briggs's bill that he's put forward, the Members' Bill on Free Personal Care. I think, I don't quote me, but I'm pretty sure it's Fife Council. Have, they're the only council in Scotland, as far as I'm aware, that do provide some sort of free care for under 65s, um, which is also, this affects women a lot more than it does men. So that would probably be the only example of good practice I can think of off the top of my head right now. Thank you, Shari. And finally, Rebecca. Sure, I'd also like to support what my colleagues have said. I think the issues that we outlined in terms of the national budget are maybe even more severe when we look at local budgets, especially in terms of equality evidence and equality evidence around race in particular. Um, I think we're very supportive of evidence-based policy and making budget decisions based on what the evidence tells you, but with such a lack of race equality specific evidence at a local level, it's very hard to say where spending should be focused. So I think the first step is to look a bit further into that and evaluate kind of programs that are in place at a local level. Um, the point about equality impact assessments has been well made and I think we would agree that if those were done better and in more detail at a local level and a national level, we'd be a lot further on in our aspiration to make Scotland a, a very equal country. Um, we were very supportive of amendments that were put through yesterday with the child poverty bill that required consideration for impact protected characteristics might have at a local level as well, because I think we find sometimes that even if there's a national kind of directive out there to consider equality, it doesn't always demonstrate itself at a local authority level. So again, same problems, but perhaps a bit amplified. Thank you, Rebecca. Mary. Um, convener and, and good morning, um, panel. My, my question is around um, funding for, for race inequality. So my question is aimed specifically at Rebecca, but I'd, I'd also be interested in hearing what, um, what Danny has to say. Because from, from reading your um, evidence, um, Rebecca, when you talk about um, fully understanding the inequalities faced by BME communities, particularly in relation to employment and, prior, and poverty, should be a high priority for the <laughs> Scottish Government. And while my main question is around how we make sure the funding is specifically aimed at reducing inequality, unless we do an assessment to fully understand what that inequality is, it doesn't matter where the money's put, it's never going to tackle the inequality. So how do we accurately assess the inequalities? Because I know um, across budget portfolios, they look at um, inequality in housing, inequality in um, employment, training and different opportunities. But do you think there's not enough in-depth work done to look underneath the figures to look at race? So earlier this year, the Scottish government's equality evidence strategy was published. And that was one of the things that was called for in their race equality framework. It outlines a lot of missing pieces of evidence for race equality. Some of those in terms of employment include 
sorry, uh, workforce data from public sector organizations, data on the ethnicity pay gap, um, procurement data in relation to employment, social security take up by ethnic group, the effect of positive action schemes aimed at addressing disadvantage, intersectional analysis. So I think the gaps have been identified. What the quality evidence strategy did not do was put in place um, the means to sort of address those gaps. Um, it kind of laid out general principles for how gathering this evidence would be prioritized. I think there's a hesitation maybe to invest in kind of new surveys or new initiatives to gather evidence because it's quite a cost forward thing, more so than just publishing evidence that's maybe collected but hasn't been disaggregated or published in that way before. I think we would argue in terms of employment and poverty especially, we know there's such a particular impact on minority ethnic groups um, that we need the evidence to speak to better in order to make our arguments more, strengthen our, ev or our arguments further. Um, so I definitely would argue that there needs to be kind of that investment in gathering that evidence. And then once that evidence is gathered, putting in place actions to address the gaps that have been identified. And as important as gathering the evidence is putting in place funding that's allocated to projects and initiatives that evaluates how well those projects and initiatives are tackling discrimination and advancing equality and furthering good relations. Um, there's very little detail about those three in particular in the equality budget statement. So I think there just needs to be putting money towards equality is good and it's always welcome, but I think we want to make sure it's going where the disadvantage is the sharpest and that we're making the greatest impact that's possible as a result. Did that answer you? Yeah, that, that's helpful. Danny, I don't know if you wanted to comment. Yeah, thanks very much. <clears throat> There's variations across different sectors uh, in relation to employment where we could, some solutions are going to be easier than others. Uh, so maybe ponder on two. The problem generally with stats, with the census, with the equality evidence finder, a lot of which is based upon data which were pulled out of the census, is that it's, it's telling us the issue and the story of something or the outcome of an inequality and the inequality occurred maybe five or ten years ago. So we've already got to the end of the process in terms of lack of representation or employment of ethnic minorities within the public sector, for example, where there's quite clearly a large uh, under-representation. Now, what we can do is spend the next five years trying to retrospectively amend a problem that's already changed. And that's where the concern is. This is what this committee specifically offers the opportunity to do differently. It's about our initial point, our general point, about ensuring there's a strategic approach across portfolios in national and local government or any statutory body to actually ensure that when we're spending money that we get the best bang for our buck, not only in terms of building a bridge, but who built the bridge? What communities did they come from? Was it representative? Were all of the opportunities which came as part of the tendering process to build a capital infrastructure project X analysed from the get-go to the end point to ensure that we raise employment, raise opportunity, raise our local uh, and national economy? So these, there, there's no simple answer to it. It's also not an issue of just taking some cutting, uh, you know, 8% of the national population are from ethnic and cultural minority communities. Okay, every budget across the portfolio, you've got to direct 8% of your funding or 8% of your, of your capital infrastructure or finance to um, ensuring that there's uh, equal representation. It, it won't, it, it's, it's not going to work like that because there's variations, as I said, across different sectors. So you have to have a strategic approach to it. Now, the data which we have available, um, if I take, for example, employment within the Scottish Government, we saw from the race disparity audit, which came from the UK Government, that I think within the civil service of the Scottish Government, the representation of ethnic minorities is 1.2, 1.4%. It's incredibly low. Um, you know, so w within that very specific sector, what could we do to amend it? That's not a case of throwing money at it. That's a case of raising awareness of the opportunities when they come around and the system of how you apply for those uh, opportunities and how you go through uh, the, the application process. When it comes to changing something as endemic as underrepresentation within uh, the public sector, well, we're about to enter into a period of public sector recruitment freeze, 
which has been maintained. So I can't see necessarily where we're going to make wholesale uh, changes in that regard. But again, go back to the Scottish Government example, it's a systematic issue. So where are we actually spending money? We're spending money on modern apprenticeships, we're spending money on capital uh, investment, we're spending money on um, you know, areas such as this, but we don't have any strategic focus on how that money and reference to race equality and potentially other protected characteristics is actually making a positive impact, uh, both in terms of employment, uh, but local and national economy. Inclusive growth, we need a more strategic overview okay. of it. So how do we fix it? <laughs> well, oh. One of the things I would point to would be the report that last session's Equal Opportunities Committee did on removing barriers, race, ethnicity, and employment. There are several actions outlined there that the Scottish government, local authorities, public bodies could take forward to address um, not really a deficit-based model, but kind of look towards where discrimination and disadvantage is present and respond to those needs in particular. So I think in that regard, there's a lot of evidence. There's been a lot of research. There's been very welcomed specific recommendations put forward. What's needed now is acceptance of those recommendations and investment to sort of see them through. So that would be one area where I would point the committee towards what could be done. Before I come I'm back to Danny, because I, I can a constant frustration of mine, and I know it's a frustration of other members of this committee, is we produce guidance, <laughs> we do evaluations, we do reviews, we do more guidance, we do more reviews. And it always seems to me as it's, it's another book that sits on a shelf somewhere and gathers dust, or another policy that's reviewed after two years. Um, and, and rather than do a full in-depth assessment of what went wrong with the policy, we bring another one out. And I don't know if, if you both share that view and how we can change that. Well, from a race equality perspective, you know, over the next couple of weeks, we we'll see the publication of the independent uh, advisor's um, analysis of the race equality framework and how she would envisage taking things forward. And we we'll see the Scottish Government's race equality action plan about actually amending and putting uh, these identified issues into practice. And I'm returning to the same point over and over again. This needs to be uh, embedded strategically uh, and have an, a, a, an awareness which can be uh, measured, measured uh, across relevant power dynamics and portfolios. So There's the evaluation of it is the, is the critical factor? Well, a continual evaluation of it. You know, the race framework's 2016 to 2000, 2030. Mm -hmm. Can't come back in 2030 and just have the same conversation again. Mm -hmm. There has to be targets and measures can, uh, throughout. Uh, and that's not, that's not targets and measures that have to be set and put on the, the door of the equality unit mm -hmm. or BEMIS or CREAR <clears throat> or SEMVO or the equality officer at Glasgow City Council or the equality officer uh, at any local authority across Scotland. You know, there, there's still a propensity whenever it comes to actually strategic management or not strategic management, retrospective, uh, ask a question about why something's not working and go and consult someone and find out what we're going to do about it, a tick box exercise. And what we're not doing is embedding uh, even the, the first aspects of a strategic conversation about how we're going to use our budget to amend some key uh, and substantial uh, inequalities in Scottish society. And that's where the fear aspects comes in, because when you place that um, collaborative challenge uh, at, at the door of you know, any director of any department, they're, they're instantaneously, potentially, uh, going to see it as an additional responsibility or a concern which they have to take forward. Whereas what we're saying is it should be an empowering uh, experience for, for, well, for us all collectively <laughs> as a society. I don't mean that to sound like philosophical gobbledygook, but it's, it's really the only um, coherent way forward that we can see. Yeah, that's helpful, thank you. Rebecca, did you want to comment? I guess I would just, um, CRER did a lot of kind of background research when we were working on the race equality framework for Scotland. We produced evidence papers looking at community cohesion, justice, participation in public life, employment, equality, education, health, housing. Um, so aside from the things we identified in the um, quality evidence strategy where evidence is still lacking, and again, a lot of those are around employment and poverty, there is a good body of evidence, and that body of evidence went towards designing the framework, which is cross-portfolio. It outlines what should be priorities for 
various government departments. So I think in terms of race equality, we've identified where action needs to be taken. What would be great to see would be a reflection of not just a commitment to funding the implementation of the race equality framework within the funding for the equality unit, but see that mainstreamed across departments and see that commitment reflected in the portfolios and made more explicit in the budget statement and equality impact assessments that come from the projects and initiatives that the statement references. Thank you, Convene. Thank you, Mary. Um, I want to come back to the issue of ring fencing that I touched on briefly at the start. Uh, it strikes me, and my background is in children's rights, so um, I, I don't have as much experience of your areas of the equalities agenda, but certainly there was a frustration about the fundamental disconnect that uh, existed between the very laudable uh, policies passed by this parliament, the Act of Parliament, uh, and their implementation on the ground, particularly through budgeting. Um, we live in a more enlightened time, so happily, this parliament continually pushes the boundaries of the equalities agenda, but that falls down most often when there are no resources on the ground to make that real. And I think, for example, part one of the Children and Young People Act, which was about children's rights and imposing duties on uh, local authorities to, to bring forward that agenda. However, that was not met with any kind of budgetary line because of the presumption against ring fencing. And it happened in that same year that we saw the number of children's rights officers in Scottish local authorities have, despite the intent of that bill. Um, would you, do you think it's time for this parliament and this government to review the presumption against ring fencing in the equalities agenda so that if this parliament passes legislation which has a, a demonstrable need to implement at a local authority level that we need to start having a direct line of sight to where that budget is coming from and how it is spent i think perhaps if we hit, can hear from emma and shari first because we heard quite a lot from the others in the last question mm -hmm. emma I don't know if Engender has a clear view on ring fencing or not ring fencing, but I think we share the views of the strategic budget review group that there does need to be a closer connection between the strategic priorities of the Scottish Government and the legislation that the Parliament passes and the budget, which at the moment are, are, are disconnected. Um, so I think that ring fencing is one way that can be achieved and certainly we advocated um, with violence against women organisations for the maintenance of a kind of ring fencing in the form of the Violence Against Women Fund and the Rape Crisis Specific Fund in 2010 when the idea was that the, the spend on uh, rape crisis and women's aid services would be devolved to local government um, and that was considered to, to, to represent an existential threat threat to those organisations. Um, so we're, we're certainly not opposed to it in principle, nor blanket for it in principle. But I think you have put your finger on the, the thing that we are all asking for in a sense, which is a connection between the ambitions for equality and the realisation of rights and spending across the portfolios. Uh, and I think our evidence identifies a slight problem with ring fencing equality money to some degree in that we have this 20.3 million in this central equality budget. Very welcome and um, funds, I think, all of our organisations to some degree or another, um, but cannot possibly bring about equality in Scotland. Um, for that to happen, there needs to be spend in the health budget, and there is spend in the health budget on equality. There needs to be spend in justice, there needs to be spend right across the portfolios contained within the budget. And so the question is, how do we do that and how do we make that visible and how do we make those connections? Um, and our strong pitch is that gender budget analysis is internationally demonstrated to achieve that. I think what my colleagues from the race sector are calling for is for race equality to be integrated into that equality budgeting process, which I think is also the ambition of the equality budget statement. So then the question is, how could that be improved in order to achieve what we seem to be wanting it to achieve, which is that the impact of spending on different protected groups should drive the allocation of resources and its visibility within the budget. Because the Scottish budget, if you read it from cover to cover, is not just a list of numbers, as this committee will know, but a, a list of commitments and a narrative about what is important to the nation of Scotland. And our strong call is for equality and rights to be reflected more strongly in that narrative that we tell ourselves um, and the narrative of where we want to put our resources in order to achieve 
the best thing for the people of Scotland. Thank you, Emma. Shari? Um, yeah, like uh, in gender, our organisation doesn't have a particular stance for or against ring fencing. There's many arguments of the pros and cons. Um, I do think, yes, that you have put your finger on it, though. Just ring fencing and giving a commitment doesn't arguably always mean that that commitment is seen through. Um, a really big example that women come to us with, and which we've put in our submissions time and time again, is childcare. So, for example, the Scottish Government keeps putting more money towards childcare, which is so welcome. But the problem is that a lot of this is still in the typical nine to five routine. Now, for a lot of women, especially going back to work, they're either going into the likes of the hospitality sector, which is antisocial hours, or they're in returners programmes, which again, in night classes, which again, is not included in childcare, leaving them out of pocket because they're having to go and um, pay their own private ones, which is even more money after hours. I think it's after six o'clock. It goes up exponentially. So even though the Scottish Government is committing money, and we welcome that so much, it's how this money is getting spent and how it's getting committed to achieve the outcomes for equality. Can I just ask on that, I, I take it that your organisation would support the recommendations on the McLean Commission into the future of publicly funded childcare, which suggested uh, the sort of introduction of childcare <coughs> accounts, which would give people almost a self-directed support um, reality to their childcare commissioning, whereby they could commission out of via childcare, they could engage perhaps uh, more casual uh, arrangements for that occasional requirement for childcare, which perhaps the nine to five model doesn't fit. Is that fair? Yeah, anything because the nine to five model is just not working yeah. for women. Women keep coming to us time and time again and telling us this because it's just not feasible. Women disproportionately do not work these hours, especially in this day and age. That's good to hear. Bring in our colleagues from the race equality organisations. Rebecca. I would echo a lot of what Emma's put forward where there is kind of a danger with the equality budget does equality, and that means the rest of us don't have to. I think there needs to be kind of a move towards mainstreaming and integrating equality more thoroughly throughout portfolios. I guess what I'll say to the point of ring fencing, because CRER also doesn't particularly have an organizational opinion on it, is that equality doesn't work when it's put in as an afterthought. That doesn't work when we put together a program and then after you know, the policy has been set, consider how it's going to affect different equality groups in different ways. It doesn't work for policies, and I don't think it works for budgeting either. It, it shouldn't be an afterthought before a policy is written and put into place. There needs to be an impact assessment done to consider the different disparities that might come from it, how we might mitigate inequalities that are related to it. Um, and I guess that is, that's related to your, your point on ring fencing. Equality shouldn't be an afterthought. If we want it to be implemented further and make more progress, then there needs to be dedicated funding that's been well evidenced and will be well evaluated. And finally, Danny, is there anything you'd like to add? Yeah, I'll maybe just give a specific example. I thought Emma covered perfectly and succinctly from a gender and uh, race equality perspective in terms of embedding it within the equality analysis. Um, ra radical or radical ideas, I suppose, exist uh, already within the public domain about how, if we were coherently part of that process or strategically part of that process, we might uh, use uh, our budgetary mechanisms in order to um, progress some s substantive change. So I'll give a very specific example uh, with regards to the so social security budget. Uh, so as already has been alluded to, uh, I think it's around about 2.7 billion, 15% uh, of the national spend in Scotland will now be spent via the, the new devolved mechanism which came via the Smith Commission. Now, as uh, an add-on to that, um, we have the capacity uh, to create new benefits as part of uh, that particular um, devolution of power. Now, there was a great piece of research done by the Child Poverty Action Group and the Social Policy Research Unit who found that were the Scottish Government to increase child benefit by £5, five pound per child per week, 30,000 children would be lifted out of poverty after housing costs. If the increase was £10 per child per week, 59,000 would be lifted out of poverty. The cost of these increases would be between 256 and 512 million, respectively. From a race equality perspective, and this is where we come into the intersectionality between devolved and reserved powers. Many of the communities, or a, a good number of the communities we work with, children don't have access to the £5, never mind the £10, due to their immigration status. 
So our policy proposal to the Social Security Bill in the Scottish Government was to look uh, constructively um, at potential ways to extend um, that provision to ensure that children from ethnic and cultural minority communities, virtue of their immigration status, can also uh, receive in some relevant way a discretionary payment which would enable them to uh, access that, obviously taking into account that we wouldn't want to uh, aggravate whatever their uh, the rules on immigration are. But that's, that's an example of if we'd been involved in that particular process, we could have tried to tease that out. That's a really helpful example. Can I just ask, in, when you say immigration stages, you mean those who have no, no recourse, recourse to public, to public funds. funds? Right. Yeah. Well, yeah that's so very helpful. I'm, I'm happy to share the yeah. policy position with the committee because there was a raft of questions attached to it which would have given us much more clarity about what that number may have been. And then obviously we have the, the legal aspects of that not aggravating their immigration status. That's very helpful. Thank you. I believe, Jamie Green, you have a supplementary. Uh, thank you, convener, and good morning, panel. Um, I just wanted to um, expand the school of thought. I think perhaps that Danny mentioned around um, government, uh, government capital spend and procurement processes. And something I've been looking at carefully recently is how we uh, modernise and redesign public procurement across the board and across all government agencies to ensure that it is more inclusive uh, regionally, for example, but also just to ensure that Scottish businesses are able to participate to the best level that they can, and especially SMEs. Now, how do you think this could work in practical terms? I, I hear what you're saying around ensuring that, for example, the building of a new bridge, which uh, you know will be over a billion pounds, or the development of a new train line, or more public housing uh, being built, etc. How do you actually put into the process mechanisms that ensure that the public money is given to uh, developers or, or constructors who will take into account uh, more protected characteristic inclusion in the workforce or will uh, or that the building of that project will achieve any aim of the aims that you're seeking to achieve uh, I'm struggling to make the, the direct link in a practical terms yeah I mean there's already precedent in terms of the tendering process or procurement process where there are already um, elements which have to be adhered to or are classified in a hierarchical way in terms of who's going to receive uh, a particular contract to do a particular job and that is around about, for example, the living wage or working conditions and so on and so forth. Our only rationale is to embed additionally within that process uh, something which is similar to the EQIA process uh, in order to assure that when companies are coming forward to take on a uh, potential significant uh, public spending contracts is that companies, as I'm happy again to share this report, it's a report uh, being instead on poverty and ethnicity, which was released in January 2016. Companies, uh, so this was directly in relation to the housing provision and potential forthcoming development of 50,000 new homes, should be subject to an EQIA with all facets of their development to maximise potential in both location, allocation, sustainability and procurement. Com and I think this is the, the crux of what you're asking. Companies with accessible and transparent evidence of equalities training, representative workforce targets and commitment to positive action in apprenticeships targets and employment as part of the tendering process. So embedding that within the tendering process where there is already a, a, an element of, of uh, aspiring to other equalities dimensions. So just to uh, apologies, if I could uh, develop it just one, once more. Uh, <clears throat> are you saying therefore in a scenario where a company is, has failed to demonstrate uh, that they they are able to meet the criteria, this additional criteria, that they that in that situation they shouldn't be given public funds. So, if there are two competing tenders, for example, that the preference by default should be given to the one that will help, you know, meet more inclusive objectives. Well, the whole premise of inclusive national growth would predicate that that would be the much more sensible option to take. It's not for me to place. Uh, uh, that particular legal duty on anything, but certainly from an equalities perspective, it would make sense. And that's what I think that's exactly what we're talking about here in terms of when we say get the best bang for our buck, it's not just the physical infrastructure of what is built, it's actually everything else which happens round about it and the economy which is developed as part of it. And ensuring that if we spend uh, £10, that that £10 is also not only building whatever we've built, but is also enabling more people to get into employment who might not actually be uh, or might be part of a group which is underemployed, that would seem 
logical. Uh, and uh, as I'm saying, it's, it's, it's just building into uh, already equalities aspects which exist within the tendering process. Thank you. OK. Um, I have a, a final question just about the something that's come up several times. Oh, sorry, Emma, did you want to come in on that question? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, could I just um, follow up on that point? Um, Women in Scotland's Economy Research Centre at Glasgow Caledonian University has done quite a lot of work on procurement and equality, so I'll be glad to share with, with you the summary of, of the available research. Um, I would note a couple of things. Firstly, that it's already a requirement on public bodies to take an equalities approach in their procurement. The specific duties of the Scottish public sector equality duty require it. Um, and secondly, it is complicated to implement, and I think we haven't got a myriad of examples of good practice. The Olympic Delivery Authority, I think, is cited often as one of them, um, but in a Scottish context, I think we are an emerging um, good practice rather than um, having lots of examples to share. But the Equality and Human Rights Commission um, is doing a piece of work around city deals to work with the city deal um, local authority leads to try and work out how best it can support them to um, deliver on their public sector equality duty requirements, but also to think creatively about how this may work um, to enable and encourage businesses to act in an equalities-minded way and to succeed because of that, because there is a, a very strong evidence base um, that those businesses, including SMEs, that engage with equalities agendas um, <coughs> benefit from that in terms of creativity, productivity, um, morale, all of these things improve. So I think it's an aspiration for Scottish businesses as well as for Scottish public sector and Scottish communities. Thank you, Emma. I believe Gail Ross has a question. Sorry. <laughs> when I've stopped coughing, I will. Thanks. Thank you. Good morning, panel. Thank you for coming along. Um, I want to go back with quite a pointed question about um, what we were talking about, local authority, um, equality impacts assessments. If, in a budget line, a local authority decided to cut money for its cleaning contracts for schools, knowing that these jobs were mostly taken by women, is that an equality issue? Um, I, th I think um, you could argue that anything really is a quality issue when it comes to local authority because it has a completely different effect on women to, ha to how it has on men. So if in your example, yes, I would say it is an equality issue because women do tend to be clustered in these roles, um, the likes of cleaning and clerical work. So yes, definitely, I would say that the likes of that. But how it is monitored is a completely different uh, aspect and angle, and it's how to get that monitored in an equalities way. Okay. Um, there were some um, really good examples that we've started to get out about um, how budget lines can affect um, equalities, such as flexible childcare or the, the child benefit or tax credit um, add-ons. Um, Emma, you mentioned that there are already um, some equalities uh, in the health budget that, that we already address. Could you maybe give us a, an example of something that we already do well? Hmm. Um, I may need to come back to you on that. What I was thinking about when I was talking about that is that we do target a lot of differentiated spend within the health budget on um, ensuring that women and men who have separate needs for health services have those needs met. So in terms of national screening programmes, um, maternity specific healthcare, um, and perhaps specifically within Scotland, um, some of the gender identity healthcare provision um, that is provided to um, support the equality and rights of trans um, young people and people. So I can, I can add to that list, but all of those things are invisible um, within the current budget articulation. And so our uh, ambition is to see that brought to the surface much more. Because as Danny said, it's not about, um, gender budget analysis is not about 50% for men and 50% for women. It's about ensuring that our spend as a nation meets the needs of the citizens. And so this is one way of doing that because men and women still in Scotland live um, quite different lives and have quite different needs when it comes to public services. Um, I'd also like to touch on um, the uh, budget group 
and I think that it was mentioned, the, the budget advisory group. How do we go about getting more people with protected characteristics actually giving advice on how the decisions are made for their particular groups? I think at the moment there's not a representative on the group who has a specific expertise in race equality. Um, this predates my time at CRER, but I believe the issue was raised several years ago. And I think there was maybe an attitude that if there was general equalities expertise that kind of fit the bill, um, I think we would disagree with that and say that you don't, you don't know what you're missing, you don't know kind of the disadvantages you're not aware of, you don't know the differential impact unless you have those voices in the room. And if, you know, if it's not possible to appoint a representative from each protected characteristic group on the, on the group itself, then I think there needs to be much more consultation done with groups who have expertise in that area, um, directions towards resources where kind of discrepancies can be identified further and just kind of a, a more conversation approach to it. I think it's, it's similar to equality impact assessments. It doesn't work so well if um, you kind of look at the finished product and then comment on it. It works much better if you're thinking about equality from the get-go and thinking about differential impacts from, from the start. Thanks, Rebecca. I, I'm, I know Danny wanted to come in on that as well. Yeah, it may, maybe just to build on that very, very slightly and then respond to your first question, which was regards to um, the, the cleaning contract and is that an equalities issue? Because we, we had a very similar a situation in another sector which we regarded as an equalities issue but we kind of hit a brick wall with it. Um, I would agree with what Rebecca is saying but again it goes back to her initial point about it's not just about the communities articulating the variations and circumstances which they face, it's also about that strategic direction when we can quite clearly evidence inequalities within a, a particular policy area that that's part of um, the analysis of, of the people who hold the power dynamics with regards to it. So I'll give an example where there's a cross-cutting issue about low pay uh, and overcrowding uh, in housing. So we know from, our, um, from, from the census stats that people from Polish and African communities are significantly more likely to live uh, in poverty and significantly more likely to live in overcrowding. Now, after we looked at that, we also looked at, OK, well, where are these people employed? And it was quite clear from that quite simple analysis um, that in the, under the, the guise of the Agricultural Wages Board, there was significant numbers, uh, you know, anywhere between 15 and, uh, or sorry, anywhere between 10 and 15,000 people from, from Poland or A2A migrants um, who, who work in this particular sector and also suffer or, or live in particular social and economic uh, disadvantage. Now, the interesting thing about the Agricultural Wages Board is that it's a, a trilateral partnership between four, Scottish, uh, four, four independent commissioners who are appointed by Scottish ministers, representatives of the farmers' unions, and representatives of the trade unions. And this is included in the Poverty and Necessity Report that I'll share. Now, we argued, and this is relevant to the human rights aspect, and um, to give due regard to or, or promote uh, that the Scottish living wage across all sectors within which the Scottish Government has influence. Now, as I've said, the mandatory payment uh, of the living wage which exists across all um, across Scottish Government and public authorities over which it has uh, control is, is mandatory, but within the, under the guise of the Agricultural Wages Board, it's not mandatory. So it's less than the living wage. Now, we argued that that was an equalities issue because we can quite clearly see that a community which has validity under the Equalities Act, um, which we can quite easily identify, suffers some severe form of social and economic disadvantage, are clustered uh, in a sector which doesn't pay the living wage. Now, when we argued that, uh, people listened, but then we were told, oh, no, if you do that, you're going to collapse the soft fruit sector in Scotland, so you can't do that. Um, you know, so that that's an example of an identified issue, a potential solution, and I was actually not really getting anywhere with it. Okay, and the local authority, did you want to come back in on that specifically? No, I, no, 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 so no. I'm, I'm, I'm giving you, I'm giving you, so you're, you're, yeah. you're asking, <clears throat> is it an equalities issue if a local authority cuts a contract? Yeah. Arguably, yes, but it's also an equalities issue. I mean, there's various, there's, there's other examples of those equality issues occurring uh, where the power dynamic is held by, by a different group. 
Yeah. No, I was just wondering, because at the bottom of um, some council papers, you get, you know, are, are there any equalities issues with this? And if it's a, you know, how far do they have to look into it then to say yes or no? And it's it can be very uh, complicated for them, I think. For us looking in at it, it's not so complicated. Thank you, Gail. And that nicely brings us up against the time that we have today. Uh, I'd like to thank each of you for your very fulsome uh, testimony and your written responses. Um, as ever, if there are additional points you'd like to raise with us, this dialogue is always open and we'd be uh, absolutely delighted to hear from you. Um, so I suspend this session uh, meeting to go into private session and thank the panel for their involvement. Thank you.